Father, we just thank you for the children. We thank you for the workers. We thank you for life. We thank you, as Chad said, just for the smallest little things to think that you actually really do get excited about just blessing us as, as, we, as Chad shared, just, um, just made for us. And we thank you now that they're growing in the grace and the knowledge of God in this time. We ask your presence now to each and every one of us. Lord, everything I say might not be for everybody, but there, I believe you're going to speak to everybody yourself, and we're all here to listen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, there's a pastor in uh, Albania, and uh, I'm trying to find what he just Oh. Hey, we were just discussing things on the internet. He goes, you are far away. <laughs> you are far away. And I need really, I don't want to read it, it just says it's written. And I need really friend to talk, I mean really man of God. And I just thought about that, that uh, uh Getting the privilege now of of being in the ministry about 40 years, um, and all through my ministry, uh, it was prophesied over me when I was in seventh grade and went forward in an Assembly God meeting. A, a man laid hands on me, and I didn't know what was going on, but he said, you will be a, a leader of leaders. And so through the years, I asked the Lord, what does that mean? And he says, well, what's a leader do? And I said, a leader puts on a cloth on his hand and he ministers to people. He gets down and washes their feet. And he said, that's what you will do. You will be a servant to leaders and help them and serve them. And so one of the things that I find in, in most of these, uh, when I travel and even here in the States so often, a lot of ministers are just overwhelmed. Uh, they feel lonely. Um, they feel a lot of pressure. And, some, and like he just said, he says, uh, I really want a man of God that's close. And yet it's interesting because a lot of times when I get introduced overseas, it's uh, here's John, a real man of God. But the truth is, if you're born, born again, you're a real man of God. You're a real woman of God. You are a saint. You know, it's interesting how we kind of went with tradition of, you know, the saints, you had all these things to qualify. But the Bible is very clear. If you've been born again, you're a saint. If you've been born again, you've been born, as we talked about last week, blameless, spotless. Uh, the difference between being born in the flesh and being born in the spirit is totally radically different. One's birthed in sin and in anger and, and all those issues. And whether you fall into all that or not, you're still, that's your DNA. And, but when you get born again, you've got the DNA of Jesus in you, and you're perfect and you're blameless and spotless. Very few people really catch that. Very few people really know how to walk in that. Uh, so when they introduce me, I, I, I go, you know, we, we all are perfect in his sight because of his work and what he did, not because of what we did. But I thought about that, just the need for uh, leaders to, um, <clears throat> to be encouraged. Uh, and yet all of us are leading. All of us are doing it. We all have responsibilities. We all have people that we're that uh, look to us and, and uh, everybody, even, you know, even a one-year-old can lead a whole group of other one-year-olds. Go to daycare and have one cry and watch the whole troop follow. Uh, they're all leaders. So <clears throat> I want to read to you, first of all, out of Matthew 9, 9. It says this. It says, And Jesus went on from there. He saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth and he said to him follow me and he got up and followed him you know Jesus said follow me I th I've counted at least 35 times when he said it uh, and I was just watching our dogs the other day we 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 have well we have three full-time dogs we have about Sometimes one, two, three, about four more that show up. And they're just, their personalities are really crazy. They just, they're just like humans. They just got, anyway, what, Seth's dog is 
he's alpha. He really wants to be alpha. He doesn't, uh, um, he, he really, he's just alpha. And I, I, I don't know, did alpha come from the Greek word alpha? Is that where we get the dog that wants to be in charge? Jesus is the alpha and the omega. He's first. Is that where it came from? I don't know, really know. But anyway, so <clears throat> but it's funny. If a dog that thinks he's alpha, boy, he just, he's got an attitude. And he wants to establish that he's alpha, you know. And in the wild kingdom, it's the same way. And then you got my dog, <clears throat> and he, he doesn't want to be alpha. He just wants to jump and run. And so when Gage is, you know, when you're holding the toy for Seth's dog to throw it, he's just sitting there intense, serious. And I have to say, he's just a hair on the grumpy side. You know, he's just always serious. He's just always, you know, you know. And my dog is jumping over him back and forth, just leaping over him. He just loves to bounce. He's just a tigger. He just, you know, he just, you know, and so when you throw it, uh, once in a while, you know, my dog's younger, he could get there first, but he always leaves it for the alpha dog because he knows it's a big deal for him. Once in a while, he'll torment him, take it, and tease him for a little bit, and then he'll, you know, and if, it, if he can't find it, then my dog will find it, and then he'll just run by Gage and drop it down so he can find it. He just takes care of the alpha, but he just loves being the bouncy tigger. And I was talking to the Lord again, and this has been an issue all my life of, you know, with, there's so many times. I'm, I mean, I'm not a downbeat person, but I take life awful seriously. And sometimes I, I go to the Lord and say, man, Lord, help me. I just need to get a little happier. I mean, I take life, it just, it's just so stinking serious. There's so many serious things going on all over the place. And uh, so I kind of get a little sober-minded. You know, I got all kinds of scriptures to back up. You know, being sober-minded, you know, and, and being alert and all that. But at the same time, the Lord... Jesus was more joyful than all his companions. And that just blows my mind to, uh, to think about how happy Jesus was. I don't know if your image of him is that way or not, but some of the Roman soldiers and stuff and Josephus and some of those writings of history outside the Bible just said that you could always know what village Jesus was in because you could hear him. He was very loud. And the children are always there around him. And he was laughing. He had a, they said he had an incredible laugh that was very uh, noticeable. And that's kind of fun to think about, isn't it? Here's Jesus coming to the earth, and he's got the most serious thing in the world to do. He's got to die, and he's got to go through and be separated from the Father. And yet he, the Bible even says that it, he, was, he rejoiced. He actually danced. And that's kind of a cool thought, too, to say, oh, Jesus, I mean, kind of mind-blowing to say he rejoiced. He spins about kind of crazily. And, and I, you know, and I enjoy doing that, and I do do it, but there's times I just say, well, Lord, you need to help me here. Uh, and after all these years, it's funny how you got to keep working on everything. You got to keep working on things, and it's worth it. So I was just thinking about that, and <clears throat> I was thinking about my dog, and I go, he's more joyful because he doesn't need to be alpha. He's not in competition. Gage and, and uh, another dog called Bjorn, he's a big dog. He, he, they're the ones kind of getting in fights, you know, having established themselves. It's just like they don't have near as much fun. They're very intense, so when they do get to, re, you know, they do that, do enjoy what they're doing. But my dog, he just, he just, he actually ministers to me. He just loves to, to live, you know, and uh, fairly careless. I mean, he, if he can get away with it, he'll get away with it. Uh, if you get hard on him, he'll, he'll obey. And it, but I thought, maybe, maybe that's part of my wisdom that I need. In John 10, 27, it says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Looking back at my life on the farm, Marty and I and my siblings, Deb, we, um, we lived in our own little culture on the farm. You know, it's, um, 
it's just different. Especially back then, we didn't travel much. We didn't come to town very often. When you did, you got enough for a couple months of groceries. Um, we never had to prepare for tragic times. We were always prepared. We always had freezers full of stuff and all that. But So we kind of had to make our own little world going there, and we did. We, With six kids, we had a lot of fun. Uh, then there's also heart issues of you know that you have with growing up, and so sometimes as we get older, we revisit, as, as Chad was saying, some of those things that kind of hurt our feelings or whatever else, and sometimes we can magnify those in our life. But looking back, I can, I can look at, I can tell you real sad stories or I can tell you really joyful stories because we had a lot of everything. But looking back, I remember, <clears throat> uh, especially in my younger teens, it, it was a lot of hard work, but it was actually still re very rewarding. And a lot of times we, we got to play a lot while we worked. I mean, you know, riding motorcycles to Irrigate was a blast. Uh, and my dad was a strong leader. He's alpha. He was definitely a boss. <laughs> it was his farm. <laughs> and, but there was a, a joy in my heart most of the time. I got a little older. I got, the, well, I got a little bit of my dad in me. So me and, me and dad started having this battle for the alpha. I didn't really know what was going on. But I'm like my dad in a lot of ways. And so, but before that, and even, even during then, it was, I'm going to put it this way, it was a joy to follow him. My dad wasn't a great one for uh, talking. I mean, he was a great personality, but when it came to work, he was serious. I get that. And he wasn't really great for just telling us everything to do. And I actually appreciated that, now that, especially now that I look back. He pretty much just led, and we figured out, we had to figure out where he was going, what he was going to do, and what we could do to support it. We used to complain to mom about that, and she'd always say, well, your dad's just not a very good communicator or whatever. But looking back, I have to say, no, actually, I'm so grateful because he really taught us to think. He taught us to look. And how did he teach us? By not saying much. By not instructing over and over and over and repeating things over and over. I mean, it's like, figure it out. If you're going to be with me, figure it out. He didn't ever say those words. We just had to figure it out. And I, I feel like Marty and I got really good at, at you know, and we we're kind of like my dog. We, we just like to play <laughs> and jump up and down, and we did. We had a blast. At the same time, we followed him. I could just about, you know, my brother and I, we could about, just about tell when Dad went out the door almost what was going to happen. I mean, where, what direction he headed, we knew, okay, this is what we're going to do today. So when I got into construction, it was the same way. Uh, a lot of times if I, you know, if I had a really good boss, I, I loved it. In fact, I, I didn't really want to be boss. I ended up being a boss because uh, I just always had this little statement that if there's any leadership is better than no leadership. So if I showed up on the job site and there was nobody really leading, not, you know, I mean, just nobody really is taking charge. I take charge. I really didn't want to be off. I didn't want to be the boss, but I'd leave it if it was, you know, nobody's going to lead. Said all that to say this, when Jesus said, come follow me, my, some of my greatest moments in life is having a great leader and just serving him. I love being on a team. And so, like in construction, we had, you know, there were some contractors I worked for and, and uh, partners, actually. And once in a while, some of my partners, we just we would just take turns being the leader for the day. We'd say, you, you lead today. You lead today. But we knew we had to have a leader. We knew we had to have somebody taking charge. When I start, first started working after I had the lumberyard, I worked for a, a man named Cliff Cord. And, and he, he was scared to hire his pastor because who wants to fire their pastor? <laughs> and I was a little intimidated to work for somebody because I was so gut shot from all the things I'd gone through in business. And yeah, we and so my only heartbeat was when I showed up on the job site, I said, I'm going to throw energy in. 
I'm going to throw energy into the team. That was my heartbeat. That's what I did. And <clears throat> I really enjoy serving a strong leader. I can really help. I can see where he's going. I can help organize the rest of the team. I can have things ready before anybody else gets there. I can, I know where the tools are. I know who needs, you know, I just, I just can, I can help and throw energy. Um, and I got to think about how fun it was. We actually had so much fun working together. I finally had to quit because he just, we, we still argue about who, who made the decision for me not to be full time with him. I think he booted me. He thinks I quit. <laughs> but we find I'm with all the, I ever all the ministry has started taking place. I was I was showing up, you know, later and later had funerals, had weddings, had this, and finally he just says, "You need to just go do what you call you're called to do." And anyway, all I'm saying is we had so much fun because we could actually go for lunch and end up ministering to a, like a fellow contractor or the concrete man. One time we just met, spent two three hours ministering to the the guy delivering the concrete to us and, and uh, sharing the Lord. And, and uh, then we just get back to the job site, and the Lord would just energize us, and we'd get twice as much done that day as we would have if we hadn't taken that time. That's fun. Man, that's a freedom that's fun. The joy of following the Lord. You know, Jesus isn't, he is the leader, he's the alpha, but he is such a great leader. He, he leads, kind of like my dad, he, he's not just telling you everything you're supposed to do and correcting you all the time. He lets you figure it out. He lets you walk it out. He lets you, uh, you know, uh, grow and develop. He, he's not a, a dominant leader that make it, it doesn't. He lets us think. He lets us feel. He lets us experiment. He lets us fail and doesn't condemn us. He encourages us to take risk. He encourages us to step out there on our own. He's, he's not the type of leader that is just, uh, micromanaging you. He wants you and me to live our, li our lives. He wants us to use everything that he's given to us and be creative. But the only thing is, he really is the alpha. He really is the one that knows everything. He is the one that's the lead. He, he is the leader, and he's such a great leader. And it is a, there's just a joy in fellowship. There's such a joy in fellowship. And I, and I realize... When I'm, I'm not as happy as I could be, when I'm not as joyful as I could be, part of it is because I'm taking on the responsibility of being the leader in so many words, and I feel that heaviness and all that, and so I get sober-minded, and I get worried, and I get concerned about everything, and I get kind of tense then when things aren't going, or, you know, we're lacking in this area, and we got you know, somebody doesn't show up, whatever else, and then I kick that on myself, and, and I thought, Jesus, he's a great leader because he doesn't do that. When you and I walk away and we don't do it, he's not stressed out. You ever been chewed out by your boss? Ever been chewed out by your dad for failing something? And You know, I've really tried as a boss not to do that, but I had my employees once said they were going to take a half hour off in the lumberyard, and they came back about three hours later laughing and giggling, and we had about 30 customers in the store at the time, and I lost it. Right in front of everybody, I chewed them out. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good thing to do. But it's like, you know, Jesus doesn't do that. He is secure. He knows he is not sweating it. He, you know, here, here's the world. Look at the, what the world's into right now. It's just a big mess. Everybody fighting for, you know, uh, wrong motives and everything else. Is Jesus stressed out? I promise you he is not stressed out. Is the Holy Spirit down here stressed out? I promise you he's not stressed out. They know the outcome. They're very patient. They have, they are, it's not going to fall apart. It's not all going to go downhill. And as Chad said, in the midst of all this is going on, they're still super concerned about you and me. There's about 7.75 billion people on the earth right now, they say. I was going to try to figure that out to help us get a vision of that, but I'm, I didn't do it. But 7.75 billion is a lot of people. That's a lot of individuals. When I was born in 1955, there was 2.8 billion. 
In 1900, there was two billion. From 1900 to 55, we only went up eight billion. From 55 to now, we've gone up. We've more than doubled, almost tripled. Where do you think that's going? There's a lot of people really worried about that. There's a lot of people that have set their whole life course to make sure that we start dropping those numbers. Bill Gates on, on his building, he has, I mean, it's just bold layered on his, you know, his building, reduce population. Tell me there's been around 65 million babies aborted in America. That's a lot of, that's a lot of lives taken in it. You know, Vietnam was a horrible war that I remember growing up with. And I think we only lost like 60,000. 64, 65 million people wiped out because man is eaten from the knowledge of good and evil and they think they know what's right and what's wrong and they make the judgments and they say, we got to reduce population. There's not enough for everybody to get by. By the way, all that's bogus. <laughs> this earth can produce. What God creates, he is just, it's amazing. It's amazing how we can screw it up and it can be fixed. So all these doomsday people are doomsday people because they decided to be alpha and be serious and they got to take charge and they got to, and they're, they, they don't have wisdom. They don't have knowledge. They have fear. They have manipulation. They have control. They have egos. And so the real God he knows what's going on. He knows how to take care of everybody. He knows how to fix everything. Okay. And all he's saying is, come follow me. When Jesus said to Matthew, come follow me, it, in the Greek it's saying, come join me. Come be a part. It wasn't just, come let me dominate you and tell you what to do. No, it's come, come and be free. Come and be what I created you to be. I'll release you. I'll release you. Not, not restrain you. Most leaders want to restrain everybody. Put all kinds of rules and regulations on. Jesus says, come and follow me and I'll set you free to, to take everything I've placed inside you. Do you realize that, I mean, we know it, but just stop and think for a moment that him and and his infinite wisdom have a plan for us to live. I'm not saying he's got every little detail figured out. He wants us to make decisions. He wants us to grow. But, but there's a place for us and a destiny inside of us that he's placed inside of us. And, you know, one of the things we do in our education system is we, we try to put them all together in a group and try to make them all the same. We actually say this is our goal, you know. No child left behind. We have things like that. We have things like... Uh, uh -oh. How about, everybody's got to pass everything. It, it, it's just so restraining, you know. Kids are creative, they say, until about the age of seven. And then their creativity just bombs out. Why? Because they went to school. And school says, you got to do it this way. And you think about that. The destiny that you and I need to complete our part in society and, do, and bring our part, not just for eternity, but our part, why we're here on earth. Uh, we have a place. God says, I, I put together like a body, and every part is going to help, and every part's going to work together, and you walk in unity. It's going to uh, be blessed for everybody. That's his plan. It's a, for real, you know. And so you and I, we have, we have uh, commissioned purposes and, to give why we're down here and to help society overall in every manner. And it, there, every one of us got different job descriptions and different st skills and ability. And what we do, and what the world does, is say, no, 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 no. That's too scary. We're going to conform you. We're going to make you all the same. And so, you know, and nobody get out of the circle. Nobody color out of the lines. Color in the lines. 
And so it just automatically takes all the creativity. It takes all the gifts, the special gifts. And so if anybody's kind of a little bit different, we go, oh, they're different. We got to kind of watch them. And, some, oh, and we can't make them like everybody else. Then we put them in a group and kind of get, cage them up. And I'm just, I'm, you know, even as parents, you know, well, I can tell you this. One of the joys of life is, is when you release your kids into God's hands. Say, God, you got a plan for them, and it is going to be special, and it is not going to be normal. And they don't have to be normal. And they don't have to. Man, I want to just encourage you. Start enjoying people around you that, and stop thinking everybody's got to pass everything, and everybody has to you can get through life and not know how to read. You can get through life and not know how to do mathematics. You, you can be a billionaire and, not, and have all, you can hire everybody to do all that other stuff. And we worry and we sweat because, oh, my kid isn't in the chart. He's a little big differ right now. He's a little small. And we worry about that stuff. Let's come back down. What Chad brought out this morning. For us just simply to believe that he has made us on purpose. He's qualified us. We're already pleasing to him. We've already won. We've already are secure. He said he'd take care of us and he will. How much more fun and bouncy could we be tigger? Could a little bit be a little bit more tiggerish? And enjoy our life if we actually just simply believe that. And actually then could actually see a flower and say, wow, that smells really good. I'm going to take time to go over and sniff that thing. My plums are blossoming and they're just kind of in the tail end. But man, what a sweet fragrance. And sometimes just to allow myself to say, it's okay, John, just to sit there and take a deep breath and say, life is good. Life is all right. He really does. It's going to be okay. Not okay. It's going to be perfect. I trust him. And even though I have responsibilities, and even though I want to change the world, and even though I want to have a huge impact, he's alpha, not me. And there's a joy in fellowship. Holy Ghost, what are you doing? For the last year, those have been nonstop my question. Holy Ghost, what are you doing? It's Sat in the hot tub again every night. Holy Ghost, what are you doing? And the other night, he just kind of dumped on me. <laughs> and he went on for like 10 minutes. He said, I'm working nations. I'm working through the leadership. I'm sorting out some. I'm, I'm handling that. I'm handling the million people that are dying. I'm reaching out to them, trying to get them saved before they die. I'm working in your congregation. He says, and just think about that. The few of us in here, how much is the Holy Ghost involved in your life? I'm telling you, it's 24-7. He is constantly watching you. He is constantly teaching you. He's constantly leading. He's constantly there available to you. Just think about that, that alone, just in our little group. We couldn't even get together all afternoon and share what the Holy Ghost is doing in our life right now. We wouldn't have enough time to review that, and then we got the next day coming. I mean, it's just massive when you think about that. And then you think about 7.75 billion people that he is intimate with, that he is overlooking. He is not one of them is overlooked. Not one of them is pushed off in the darkness. Not one of them is forgotten about. And even if they're Hindu, Muslim, whatever, not, not don't know a thing about Jesus, he's still working with them. He's still trying to lead them. He's still bringing everything under the feet of Jesus. He is nonstop doing all that. And I thought about that, and I, got, I just go... <laughs> Lord, how do you do that? How do you make me feel special? Marika feels special. Bob feels special. Everybody feels special because they are special. And how do you do that? 7.5 billion people. And then plus, you got billions of people already in heaven that he's spending time with. As Chad said, he's humongous. There's nothing that makes sense in our little brains when it comes to that. Is he worthy to be trusted? I think so. I think he can handle it. Why don't we go ahead and just have a joy following him? And by the way, everything he's doing, everything the Holy Spirit's doing, he's saying to you, to me, 
hey, come, follow me, hang with me. Let's do this together. You can join me. You can be a part of it. I said, how, how am I going to be a part of exposing the evil in this world? As, if he, as Paul said in Ephesians, how am I going to be a part? He says, just by enjoying your life and walking in the light every day. You'd be surprised how we can flip everything. Follow me. Follow me. Father, we thank you that you're a good boss. You're a good daddy. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that you, you are busy. And yet you've got time right now to be with each one of us here listening. And the people listening to my voice, you know, through Internet and, and YouTube and all that, Lord, you're, touch, you're talking to each one of us individually, guiding us, leading us. And then you've got all these great plans, and you said boldly before us that the plans that you have for us are awesome and wonderful, not disastrous. Father, we just want to come before your throne today and say we acknowledge that your Holy Spirit was sent to us to aid us, to teach us, to train us, to protect us, to guide us, to feed us, to take care of us and bring every one of our enemies underneath our feet because we're the body of Christ. Father, I know that I try not to, but I, I try to, I'm so curious. I want to be aware of what's going on in the earth and what's happening and, I, and where's that going and all that. But Father, I, that's good. We need to do that. But Holy Spirit, we're, we're asking you today with the right motive. Help us be aware of all that you're doing. As we watch the news and as we read all the headlines, Lord, may we also take time to say, Holy Spirit, what are you doing? Because you're like a wind. You're in and out of everything. We're like Matthew. We're dropping everything. It's no longer we who live. We're dropping everything and we're following you. We're joining you. And we want to throw energy into what you're doing. You instruct us, but also we want to be grow up and just see what you're doing and fall in line with it and help out. Father, I thank you that not every day in our life is spectacular. But it's all good. It's actually more spectacular than we think. Just living our everyday life in you is absolutely world changing. I don't know how you do that, but I sure love the fact that you do it. Father, I declare over this body that we're walking in the grace and the light of the gospel more than ever before, and we are the joy of the Lord is going to fill us more and more as we look intently at this freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. And we cast aside our unforgiveness and our doubt, and our disbelief, and we lay it down. Matthew walked out of that booth that was his income and his total being, uh, being a tax gatherer, and he walked out and said, no, I'd rather follow you. You'll take care of me. Father, may the records hold throughout eternity that this little group of people walked in the joy of the Lord all the days of their life on earth and accomplished the will of God. So be it. Amen. Amen. Man, I'll just do it. Have a little Tigger moments this week, okay? God bless you.